Chapter 12. The Carnation Revolution to the Present, 1974 to the Present Day. Coup and Changes A coup on the 25th of April, 1974, by the Movimiento das Forças Armadas, the MFA, Armed Forces Movement, was successful. This was a radical movement within the armed forces, essentially of junior army officers. There was scant resistance, and certainly less than in 1910, when the monarchy was overthrown. Only four people were killed. As in 1917, an unpopular war led to an army revolt that won power. Troops, unhappy about being sent abroad, were significant in both revolts. The government surrendered power to General Antonio de Spinola, a critic of the direction of the war, whose seniority made him more acceptable than the MFA, with whom Spinola sympathised. Caetano and Tomás fled to exile in Brazil. The 1974 coup led to the release of political prisoners, the legalisation of a free press and of the socialist and communist parties, and the abolition of the secret police. It is known as the Carnation Revolution, because red carnations were given to the soldiers. It was followed, however, by a period of instability that lasted until 1976, and that was more disturbed and unpredictable than the immediate aftermath of the death of Franco in Spain in 1975. After initial celebrations, the new government, the Junta de Salvação Nacional, the National Salvation Junta, became increasingly radical, nationalising much of the economy and collectivising the land. This direction led Spinola to resign as president on the 30th of September, after he had failed to stop the leftward move. Social tension increased, with the communists under Álvaro Cunhal active in land reform and using direct action to achieve their goals, a process that enjoyed support in the more radical Alentejo. Land reform, however, proved particularly unpopular in northern and central Portugal, where much of the land was run by small family farms, unlike the estates of the south, and where a strongly entrenched and popular Catholic church found itself the target of Communist Party agitation. The Archbishop of Braga, Francisco Maria de Silva, was an active opponent of this agitation. In the 25th of April 1975, elections for the Constituent Assembly, the first free election in Portugal since 1925, the Communists only won an eighth of the vote, mostly in the South. This reflected their lack of popularity. Instead, the Socialists dominated Lisbon, the Algarve and the Centre, and the Popular Democratic Party, which drew on the liberal wing of the Marcellist Party, that of Caetano, the North. The Socialists did more than three times as well as the Communists, which led to Communist talk of gaining power through a coup, it seemed possible that Portugal would become not only a left-wing, one-party state, challenging NATO, of which it was a member from within Western Europe, but also a communist one. Henry Kissinger, the American Secretary of State, feared that Portugal would be lost to the enemy bloc. He saw Portugal as potentially another Chile, where a left-wing government had been overthrown in a right-wing military coup in 1973. The increasingly conservative Spinola had fled into exile after the earlier failure of the attempted right-wing counter-revolution on the 11th of March 1975. However, in the context of an atomization of the supporters of the Carnation Revolution, the Portuguese communists lacked sufficient support within the army, and this led to the failure of an attempted coup on the 25th of November 1975 by elements of the army opposed to a rightward move of the government. Thanks to a mass anti-communist mobilisation of opinion in the summer of 1975, with large-scale rallies and demonstrations, it was clear that the proposed dissolution of the Constituent Assembly by the Armed Forces Movement would face significant opposition. This prospect both empowered civilian politicians and affected opinion within the army. Moreover, the Soviet Union did not intervene. Portugal had no contiguous border with a communist state, the Soviets had no direct overland connection to Portugal, and Soviet maritime links to it were shaky. Although recently expanded, 
the Soviet Navy was greatly outmatched in Atlantic waters and lacked an amphibious warfare component. Portugal remained in NATO, and the army and the socialists held the communists off. In February 1976, the army handed over power to civilian politicians, and in that April's elections, again on the 25th, the socialists were again the leading party, and the communists made only a modest improvement to 14.4%. The Social Democratic Party achieved the second biggest vote. To create a majority coalition, the socialists turned to the relatively right-wing Democratic and Social Centre, which came third with 16%. It was the first election held after the promulgation of the new constitution approved earlier on the 2nd of April 1976. This was not the end of the crisis, but it was the beginning of the end, in part thanks to serious economic strains, not least due to the transition to a post-imperial economy, the communist vote increased to 18.8% in the election on the 2nd of December 1979, but on the left, the socialists at 27.3% remained both the leading party and moderate. The Democratic Alliance, a coalition of the Social Democratic Party, the Democratic and Social Centre Party and two small parties, won 45.2% of the popular vote and a majority of the seats. The Agrarian Reform Law of September 1977 provided a generally acceptable limit to collectivisation, essentially restricting it to the big estates in the South, notably the communist stronghold in the Alentejo. About 1,200,000 hectares, 31% of the South, had been occupied in 1975 to 1976, the government had scant alternative to the legalisation of the process. In turn, the democratic system was sufficiently grounded to enable the replacement of the socialist government by a right of centre one of the democratic alliance in January 1980. Under Francisco Sá Canero, this government had a populist flavour but also pushed through privatisation measures. The collectivisation in the Algarve was largely reversed. In the election held on the 5th of October 1980, the communist percentage of the vote fell to 16.8, the socialists won 27.8 and the Democratic Alliance coalition rose to 47.6. Sarkanero, who had founded the Popular Democratic Party, swiftly renamed the Social Democratic Party in 1976, remained Prime Minister. Meanwhile, in 1975, Portugal withdrew from its colonies, both East Timor and the colonies in Africa, including the Cape Verde Islands, where the independence process had been peaceful. Three quarters of a million people from the large settler populations returned to Portugal with few possessions and with a potent sense of grievance. Many remained for years in hastily erected housing in shanty towns on the edge of Portuguese cities, especially Lisbon, and this brought a degree of edginess to both politics and society. With time, however, the tension was eroded, in large part due to the benefits of economic growth that became particularly apparent after Portugal joined the EEC in 1986. Portugal had applied to join in 1977 as a key aspect of a political normalisation and international acceptance that had already been seen when it was admitted to the Council of Europe the previous year. It was not to join, however, until 1986 because its entry was linked to that of Spain. The latter admission faced several problems, not least strong French concerns about agricultural competition, However, the process of joining, and therefore of wishing to be seen as acceptable, was important in encouraging moderation and modernisation in Portuguese politics. There was no equivalent to the attempted but unsuccessful Spanish coup of 1981 with its tanks on the streets and takeover of the Cortes. The legacy of the Estado Novo was not subsequently a key element in political dispute, in part, this was because there was, in effect, a pact of forgetting between the political parties, but also because there was no political movement of weight looking back to the Salazar dictatorship. 
There was no past on offer that was attractive, not least because Portugal's imperial position, which had been significant to the ideology of the Estado Novo, was totally gone. The Salazarist system did not have as strong a political afterglow as monarchy had had in the 1910s and 1920s. Moreover, unlike in Spain, the military was not the basis for political action from the right. The post-dictatorial governments did see a degree of restitution, notably for the reputation of Umberto Delgado, Salazar's opponent who was assassinated in 1965. Mario Suárez, the socialist prime minister from 1976 to 1978 and 1983 to 1985, had supported Delgado and had his remains interred in the National Pantheon. Delgado was also retrospectively promoted to field marshal, and Lisbon Airport was named after him in 2015. Much that was named by or after Salazar was renamed, thus the Pont Salazar over the Tagus at Lisbon, a suspension bridge modelled on the Golden Gate Bridge, was renamed the Pont 25 d'Abril. There are numerous Prasas 25 d'Abril, and the date became a national holiday known as Freedom Day. A very different public art was pushed to the fore, with statues of trade union activists, as in Regua, and of workers. Thus, in Alcochete, on the southern shore of the Targus estuary, a centre of salt pans, a statue of a salt worker was erected in 1985 with the inscription, From Salt to Rebellion and Hope. The 1980s. Sarkaneru died in December 1980 in a plane crash that is widely attributed to assassination. He was succeeded by Francisco Pinto Balsamao, but the latter faced a divided party and also a general strike. In the election held on the 25th of April 1983, the government did badly, and instead Suarez won with 36% of the vote. However, as this was very much a minority, the result led to a coalition with the Social Democrats, who had won 27.2% in what was called the Central Bloc. The pressures involved in preparing to join the EEC led to economic strains, as did a more general policy of economic modernisation and fiscal austerity. There was opposition from both right and left, with the Forças Populares de 25 d'Abril, FP25, opposed to the amendments to the Constitution, seeking a communist revolution, staging terrorism from the left from 1980 to 1987, Eighteen people were killed by the FP-25, which, aside from bank raids to fund itself, attacked the American embassy in 1984 and NATO ships in Lisbon in 1985. Suarez resigned in June 1985 due to a lack of parliamentary support, and fresh elections were held on the 6th of October 1985. They were won by Aníbal Cavaco Silva, the new leader of the Social Democratic Party, with 29.9% of the vote and 88 seats. The Socialists won only 20.8%. Suarez, however, became president in 1986, serving after re-election in 1991 until 1996. Once in the EEC from 1986, Portugal benefited from economic access to the European market, from investment that brought new technology as well as funds, and from financial aid. Cavac Silva, the Social Democratic Prime Minister from 1985 to 1995, pushed ahead with deregulation, tax cuts and modernisation, including with labour law reforms that led to the laying off of workers who had to be compensated, which increased government debt. There was much new building of roads and bridges with EEC funds. In Lisbon, the massive, prominent and unappealing Amoreira shopping centre opened in 1985. Old buildings were swept aside for office blocks and cobbled streets were tarmacked. The revisions of 1982 and 1989 removed the revolutionary and socialist provisions in the constitution. The former extinguished the Council of Revolution, created in 1975, and reduced presidential powers, thus speeding the civilianization of the regime and strengthening parliamentary control over it. 
The latter revision allowed for privatization. The 1990s. Growth stalled with the widespread recession of the early 1990s, and in 1992, the year of its presidency of the European Union, Portugal only remained in the exchange rate mechanism, the ERM of the EEC, with difficulty. Moreover, Portugal's backward agriculture found it hard to compete, not least with the more mechanised production of French and Spanish agriculture. Economic access to the European market meant European access to the Portuguese market, and to a degree that had not been fully explained to the public. This competition was enhanced by the consequences of the single European market, which was introduced in 1986. Combined with strikes and corruption, the government was undermined, and Cavaco Silva, who had won impressive majorities in the 1987 election, 50.2% of the popular vote, and 1991 election, 50.6%, decided not to contest the 1995 election. The election of that year, held on the 1st of October, was won by Antonio Guterres, the socialist leader, with a major swing from the Social Democrats, and the socialist candidate also won the presidential election in 1996. Guterres continued the fiscal straitjacket that enabled Portugal to join the European Economic and Monetary Union, the basis of the euro, in 1999. In 1998, Lisbon was the site of the Expo World Fair, for which the Vasco da Gama Bridge across the Tagus was built. Moreover, the Portuguese novelist José Saramago won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the same year. An atheist and communist, his work, notably the critical O Evangelio Zigun Jesus Christo, The Gospel According to Jesus Christ, 1991, had offended the Cavaco Silva government. Guterres was re-elected on the 10th of October 1999, the Socialists missing an absolute majority by only one MP. They won 44.1% of the vote and 115 seats, compared to 43.8% and 112 the previous time, while the Social Democratic Party won 32.3% and 81, the People's Party, on the right, 8.3% and 15, and the Communists, 9% and 17. The Socialists were foremost in most districts, but not in the Northeast, where the Social Democrats led. The 2000s. Economic and fiscal problems in the early 2000s led Portugal to breach the 3% deficit ceiling in 2000, while unemployment rose, as did emigration, including to Angola and Mozambique, Corruption scandals accentuated the sense of crisis. The collapse in 2001 of a Douro road bridge with many casualties caused a scandal as the government had ignored advice that it needed repair. A monument survives at the site. There was also a systemic failure to provide adequate quality housing for the rapidly expanding population in Lisbon. The Socialists did badly in local elections in December 2001, and Guterres resigned that month. He went on to be elected Secretary-General of the United Nations in 2016. The elections in March 2002 brought the right-of-centre Social Democratic Party under José Manuel Barroso to power. As Prime Minister, Barroso focused on trying to cut the public deficit, although with only limited success. He stood down, becoming President of the European Commission until 2014, to be replaced in July 2004 by Pedro Centeno López, the Mayor of Lisbon. Lacking the mandate of winning office by an election, Centeno López was widely regarded as incompetent. The government was defeated in the election of the 20th of February 2005, which was won by the Socialists. They took 121 seats on 45% of the vote, up from 96 the previous time, 2002, and won in 19 of the 22 electoral districts, including in districts that historically voted against them. The centre-right parties lost over 11% of the vote they had won then, while the left bloc did well, winning 6.4% of the vote. 
José Socrates, the socialist leader, was to be prime minister until 2011, winning re-election in 2009. He had to push through fiscal austerity and structural reforms. This included an unpopular cutting of facilities in rural areas, notably elementary schools and medical facilities. In the 2009 election, held on the 27th of September, the Socialists won the largest number of seats, but lost 24 seats and 9% of the votes, so that they no longer had a majority of the 230 seats in the Portuguese Assembly. The Social Democrats increased their share by six seats, the Left Bloc by eight, and the People's Party by nine. As the Left overall won a majority of the votes and seats, Socrates was invited to form the new government. The Socialists had done particularly well in the South, Centre and Northwest, the Social Democrats in the Northeast, the People's Party in the North and the Left Bloc in the Algarve and the Upper Tagus Valley. The 2010s. Already affected by the EU's need to fund new member states from Eastern Europe and with a large debt ratio, Portugal was in a very poor position to confront the global financial crisis that began in 2008. The economy shrank, while pressure from the EU, the IMF and the European Central Bank to cut the prominent public debt led in 2010 to brutal new austerity measures that contributed to unemployment, which for those under 25 rose to over 40% by 2013, greatly encouraging emigration. The government found itself in a very difficult position. Parliament rejected an austerity package on the 23rd of March 2011, and in response, Socrates, whose socialists were in a minority, resigned, leading to the 2011 snap election. In office, in the meanwhile, as head of a caretaker government, Socrates had to seek a bailout in order to avoid the bankruptcy threatened by concern about the public finances and about a lack of competitiveness in the economy. These failures encouraged moves in bond prices linked to the worries of bond traders and rating agencies. This bailout came in the shape of 78 billion euros from the IMF, the Eurozone and the European Central Bank, a bailout agreed on the 16th of May 2011 that lasted until May 2014. In return, the government had to accept cutting its budget deficit from 9.8% of GDP in 2010 to 3% in 2013. In July 2011, Moody's, the leading rating agency, had cut the country's credit rating to junk status. Portugal went through many of the problems that Greece faced as a result of the global crisis. The crisis was not the best basis for the elections held on the 5th of June 2011. The Social Democrats under Pedro Pascoelho Coelho did unexpectedly well, winning 108 seats, 81 in 2009, compared to 74 for the Socialists, 97 in 2009, 8 for the Left Bloc, 16 in 2009, 24 for the People's Party, 21 in 2009, and 16 for the Communists, 15 in 2009. The Social Democrats won 17 out of the 20 districts in the country, including Lisbon, Oporto, the Algarve and the Azores. The Socialist percentage of the vote fell from 36.6 to 28, while that of the Social Democrats rose from 29.1 to 38.7. Socrates resigned as General Secretary of the party that night. The Social Democrats formed a government with the support of the People's Party. There was not the violence that was to be seen in Greece. Benefit cuts led to large demonstrations in 2012, albeit peaceful ones. Pensioners were hit particularly hard, but so also were most families. Coelho, the Social Democratic Prime Minister from 2011 to 2015, pushed through the changes required by the bailout. Privatisations and higher taxes were part of the equation. A political crisis was surmounted in July 2013. The 2015 election, held on the 4th of October, saw a vote against austerity, 
and have fallen in support for the right-wing coalition of the Social Democratic Party and the People's Party, the two parties losing 12% from the support they had won in 2011. They won Lisbon, Oporto and the North, but the South voted for the Socialists. Coelho failed to form a sustainable minority government and Antonio Costa, the socialist leader, became prime minister. His parliamentary majority included the left bloc, the communists and the greens. In accordance with his electoral promises, many of the austerity policies of the previous government were reversed, with state pensions, wages and working hours restored to the levels of the 2000s. Economic growth was accompanied by a fall of the budget deficit to 2.1% of GDP in 2016. In the 2017 local elections, the socialists did well. However, the public debt remained high, and there was a lack of the necessary structural reforms in the economy. In the late 2000s and 2010s, the dissension over the economic social crisis led some historians on the right to praise Salazar and the stability he had brought, a parallel to the revision on behalf of Franco and Mussolini already seen in Spain and Italy. In contrast, on the left, there was criticism of the failure of Portugal to modernise during his regime, criticism that led to counterfactual speculation about what would have happened otherwise. The breakdown in a united view of the past was an aspect of the strength of partisan politics in a period of acute economic difficulties, and also of the foundation of a broader-based right. Social issues Alongside political change, there has been social transformation since the Salazar years. This transformation is clearly marked with legislation and in popular attitudes. The first has brought the legalisation of divorce, 2001, into effect, 2002, abortion, 2007, homosexual civil relationships, 2010, and in 2017, adoption by homosexuals. Abortion became legal as a result of a referendum. The first, conducted on the 28th of June 1998, was the first national referendum in post-Salazarist Portuguese history and was proposed by the Communist Party. A law legalising abortion had gone through the Assembly, but the leaders of the Socialist and Social Democratic parties had agreed on a referendum. 50.91% voted against, with the North showing a majority against, and Lisbon, the South, a majority for. The variations by district were very great, from 81.9% yes in Setúbal to 82.8% no in the Azores. A second referendum was held on the 11th of February 2007, in accordance with an election pledge by the Socialists. The Social Democrats were divided, as they had not been in 1998. This time, 59.25% of those who voted, voted yes. The more conservative North, but not a Porto, voted no, but the cities, the South and most of the centre voted yes. Popular attitudes have seen radical changes in behaviour. The percentage of marriages ending in divorce is high, about 62% within three years. Moreover, about 52% of babies are born to parents who are not married. Attendance at church has fallen, and notably so among the young. If people still go to church for weddings and christenings and show a commitment to local saints and the linked festivities, that scarcely matches earlier patterns of observance. Decriminalising drugs In 2001, the socialist government changed the drug law. Illegal drugs remained illegal and dealers were still to be prosecuted, but possession for personal use ceased to be a criminal offence. Instead, those caught are instructed to visit the Commission for Dissuasion of Drug Addiction. Opiate substitutes are available to all users who wish to quit, and there is an engagement with therapy. In the 1990s, amid public concern and a sense of social crisis, about 1% of the population were heroin users, a high rate of HIV infection was a related problem, and drug-related crime was serious. The openness and prosperity that followed the Salazar regime was partly responsible. 
At present, there are about 33,000 heroin users, and in 2016 there were 27 fatal overdoses. The number of newly diagnosed HIV cases among drug users has fallen, as have hepatitis infection rates. Drug-related crime also appears to have fallen, while the price of most illicit drugs fell. The continued role and ambition of Catholicism can be seen with the enormous new basilica at Fatima that was inaugurated in 2007, the new cathedral inaugurated in Braganza in 1996, and, more modestly, with the annual pilgrimages to the Chapel of Our Lady of Lapa near Cernasei, a site that has attracted pilgrims since the start of the 16th century. In 2009, Pope Benedict canonized Nuno Alvarez Pereira, the victor at Aljubarrota in 1385, who had later become a mystic. However, the reality of religious commitment in a country where 97% of the population remains at least nominally Catholic was very different to much of this clerical action. None of this is unique to Portugal. Indeed, similar changes can be found in such Catholic centres as Ireland, Italy and Spain. They are part of a crisis of European Catholicism. Yet that did not make the change less significant for Portugal. It was also linked, as in other Catholic countries, to a marked drop in the birth rate. Many couples no longer married, but whether married or not, couples began having children later and had fewer this fed through into a major and apparently permanent change in the population structure. The size of the population was increasingly due to the growing percentage of pensioners and not to those of the young and fertile. In European terms, Portugal indeed has a population among those that take the least exercise. Concern grew about a likely fall in the population indeed a substantial one that would make it harder to support the growing percentage of elderly dependents. Portugal today has one of the oldest populations in Europe. Back in the 1960s, the ratio of active to inactive in the population was 1 to 2. Today it is closer to 1 to 5, which makes the sustainability of the welfare state a hot topic politically. Again, Portugal was not unique. The remedies discussed included that of trying to persuade emigrants and their descendants to return to Portugal. This remedy, however, suffered from both push and pull elements. There was some reverse migration during the growth years of the late 1990s, but then it stopped. Of the states where many Portuguese had emigrated, France, Britain, Switzerland, Luxembourg and the United States continued to offer good prospects. Thus, both the National Health Service and Boots advertised in Portugal for employees, and when last seeing a pharmacist in the Boots branch in Exeter, I found that the two on duty were both Portuguese. Once emigrants settled in Britain and elsewhere, they met partners and tended to settle down. In London, part of Stockwell became a little Portugal, with about 27,000 Portuguese and a number of restaurants, although the Portuguese were distributed more widely across London, including in Notting Hill and Brent. The 2011 census revealed 95,065 Portuguese-born residents in the United Kingdom, 41,041 in London, and in 2013 the Office of National Statistics estimated a figure of 107,000. The community really developed in the late 1990s, as unemployment rose in Portugal. In 2001, the census figure was 36,555. Some estimates are far higher than 100,000. Outside London, Norfolk was the county with the largest number. Good prospects were less consistently the case in Brazil, while the significant Portuguese community in Venezuela fled from there in the late 2010s, some back to Portugal. However, there was no equivalent to the return of Portuguese from the colonies that had occurred in the mid-1970s. Portugal's economy did not offer good prospects, and notably so for the young. The prospects were best in the Lisbon area and in Oporto, and their urban image replaced that of a rural country, 
but those were the very areas that least needed immigration. Greater Lisbon has a population of over two million. Indeed, the rise in rent there in 2018, a rise that greatly exceeded inflation, led to demonstrations in both cities against Airbnb, which was accused of removing properties from the rental market to the benefit of tourists. Tourism focused on both cities. Across the country as a whole, in 2017, there was a 17% increase in tourism revenue. The pressure on rent underlined the extent to which different interests competed. Regenerated city centre slum property was acquired by the wealthy, while ordinary workers moved to the urban edges. There were calls in 2018 from the Communist Party for an increase in the state pension, which indeed is very low. This puts pressure on family economies when the fewer young cannot support their parents, who now on average live longer than in previous generations. The small towns of the interior increasingly appear deserted by the young, their roadside cafes filled instead by old men sipping their memories, while wives and widows go to church to mumble prayers for distant grandchildren. This situation is most acute in areas where the farming could not compete with European competitors. Portugal suffered not only from the opening up to competition that followed entry into the European Union, but also from the consequent accession to the latter of the food exporting states of Eastern Europe. Spanish agriculture has fared much better. Looking to the future, European attempts to help the economies of Northwest Africa will further accentuate the competitive problem. Population moves from the land, again, were not new nor unique to Portugal, but they contributed greatly to a sense of malaise. Euro 2016. Portuguese national pride swelled on the 10th of July 2016, with televisions on across the country as Portugal beat France in the 109th minute in the Stade de France in Paris. I was in Lisbon that night and the atmosphere was certainly electric. The Madeira-born captain Cristiano Ronaldo has repeatedly won awards and is a champion goalscorer. Portugal had organised Euro 2004 only to lose the final against Greece. In Euro 2016, Portugal's first major tournament triumph, Ronaldo was the second highest goalscorer, but was stretched off the pitch in the final. The man of the match, Brazilian-born Pepe, had moved to Portugal in 2001 and made his name playing for Porto in 2004 to 2007. The year after winning Euro 2016, Portugal won the Eurovision Song Contest for the first time.